Would you open your Bible to the book of Genesis, chapter 6, if you'd like to stand with me this morning. First book of Moses, Genesis chapter 6, and verse 1. The book of Genesis, chapter number 6, and verse 1. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. And they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he'd made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But I call your attention to verse 8. Amen. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, now speak through me, Lord. Use this vessel of clay. Speak through me, Heavenly Father. In thy name I pray. Amen. From Genesis, the book of Revelation, God takes an assessment of His creation, looks down from heaven upon mankind. When He looks, He looks through eyes of righteousness, but He acts with hands of mercy. Right. Amen. God looks down upon mankind. He knows His condition before it ever happens. He already knows what He intends to do about what's going to happen. God judges from the heavens, and I'm so, so thankful that according to verse number 8 of the book of Genesis, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah means rest, and that's quite remarkable because God gave the earth rest through Noah. He's the only one who transferred from the old world into the new world. Eight souls crossed that tide of water on board the ark. Eight souls set foot on the new earth. Number eight, therefore, stamped in Bible is the number of the new beginnings. The number of Jesus Christ's name, the gematria of Jesus. Jesus is eight, eight, eight. Therefore, eight is the number of New beginnings. I'm glad God's the God of new beginnings. He didn't destroy man from the face of the earth and wipe him off into oblivion and start another creation, create another creature, put him here on planet earth, but he saw fit to be gracious and merciful to mankind. He did it through one man, Noah, and through his family. Shem, Ham, and Japheth on the plains of Shinar. Once that ark had landed on Mount Ararat, the Bible says they went out to the ends of the earth and there Shem, Ham, and Japheth repopulated this earth. Every human being on the face of this earth can trace his lineage and his genealogy back to either Shem, to Ham, or to Japheth because they're the three fathers of all mankind, all coming from Noah. God gave man another chance. He let him breathe one more time and walk on planet earth that he had been on before. For God said in the book of Psalms that man's life is in his nostrils. It's the air that he breathes in and out that comes constantly that God sends to mankind that he may live. In the book of Genesis, a remarkable thing happens in the sixth chapter. The Bible said the sons of God knew the daughters of men. And the Bible said giants were in the earth in those days. The Hebrew word translated giant is the Hebrew word Nephilim. You can do a search on that if you'd like to in a concordance and you'll find the word Nephilim is one of those strange, mysterious things that are found in the Bible. It's like Rephaim and other words that we find in Scripture. It's hard to pinpoint it and give a meaning to it, but essentially the Hebrew verb Nephal is about the closest thing we can find to Nephilim and it means fallen ones. 
These are creatures that are born of the union of the sons of God with the daughters of men. This must have been something remarkable for its day. For it must have been angels that came down that Peter talked about that kept not their first estate, kept not their house, their habitation, but came to the daughters of men. And because of that union, giants were born in the earth in those days. Two thousand years ago when the Lord was here, He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They were married and given in marriage and eating and drinking and knew not till the flood came and took them all away. They were engaged in commerce. They were engaged in daily living. They were engaged in what life was all about right here on this earth. But they weren't looking up for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and for their hope and salvation. But the church is. We have that blessed hope of our glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our life is not sustained by the food that we eat from our table. My life is not sustained by air that comes into my lungs. My life is sustained by the life giver himself who has come to this earth and given me life. Amen. This earth and earth and all that is attained to it shall melt with fervent heat, but I will be gone. Amen. To be with the Lord. So in the book of Genesis, a supernatural intervention from heaven. It'll blow your mind. You say, well, the Bible is such a boring book. That's because you've never read it. You say, well, I just don't understand the Bible. Ask God to interpret it for you. Ask the Holy Ghost to come into your heart and open up the pages of the Word of the living God. This is God's Word. Don't tell me God's boring. Amen. Why, we don't half know what we need to know about Him. The Apostle Paul said, I want to know Him. And he was born again and walked in the power of God. God took him to the third heaven, showed him some of His creation. But he still did not see the glory of God. Now I'll in the Old Testament book of Moses, he said, I want to see your glory. God said, I'll let my goodness pass before you. There's so much about Him you don't even know. It has never crossed your mind. The imagination of a human being cannot reach that high. I'm talking about an eternal being from everlasting to everlasting. There's nothing boring about God. So my friend, this book is a remarkable, marvelous book. And it'll blow your mind when you start studying it. You'll find that where everybody came from and where everybody's going. You'll find out why we're in the mess we're in and the only answer to it. You'll find out why the world and the, and, and the nations are aligned as they are today and you'll also find out what kingdom is about to come on the face of this earth and it did not originate from here it did not come from man and God doesn't need man's help for when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back he brings his kingdom with him but the Bible says a remarkable thing about Noah. said he was perfect in his generations. The Hebrew word for perfect is tanim. And it means he had not mixed with the angels. He had not mixed his blood. Therefore, he had a perfect blood all the way back to Adam. He was a pure man. That's what it meant. And so when God brought, uh, Ad, brought, brought Noah from the old world into the new world, he was saving mankind as he had made him in the garden, as he had breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. Noah was a pure man. That's what that meant. And so the Bible said he found grace in the sight of the Lord. When I think about grace, I think, my, 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 what a marvelous thing. He didn't find law in the sight of the Lord. He didn't find a commandment in the sight of the Lord. No, I wasn't told to do anything but be obedient and build an ark. And that's exactly what he did. And for 20 years, he went out and Noah preached. He preached 120 years he preached. And not a single convert. I'm sure if the ministerial association had gathered together, they said, Mr. Noah, you're an absolute and complete failure. We've given you 120 years to build a church and you don't have a single soul except your own family. It's all nepotism. It's all your group, all your bunch. Why, you're an absolute failure. God said, Jeremiah, whether they hear or whether they forbear, let them know that a prophet hath been in their midst. That's all God's concerned about. He's concerned about getting His Word out. That's all. At the judgment seat of Christ and the judgment day, we'll all know we heard the Word of God. And if you're wise today, you'll listen to the Word of God. You'll listen to what God said, not your politician. You'll listen to what God said, not your doctor. You'll listen to what God said, not your teacher. You'll listen to what God said, not another man. God's Word trumps every other word. 
If God said it, that's the way it is going to be. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What a marvelous day for Noah. Oh, you say he was lucky, preacher. Luck has nothing to do with it. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, he was a rich man. You can't buy grace. He was a good man. Grace has nothing to do with being good. Well, he paid God back. You can't pay God back. Grace cannot be bought and sold. It's not on the marketplace. Grace is a marvelous thing that originated in heaven. Have you noticed where it came from? The Bible said Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I look at that and I think, Noah, what a marvelous thing. God's going to save you from the old world and carry you over to the new world. Noah wasn't good enough for it. It's because God chose him. Noah couldn't have done a thing about it. It's because God chose him. And it's because the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Every last one of you in this house today my friend can be a recipient of the grace of God. I want you to look at it in three ways this morning. Way number one, the Bible said the grace of God that bringeth salvation. It's God ministering grace to mankind. Grace first originated in heaven. It's God the Father looking over at His Son and saying, Go now, Son. And when the Bible said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, it meant that He would never receive Him the same again. When the Lord Jesus Christ left out of glory, He did not go back the way He left. The Lord Jesus Christ left out of glory as the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Word of God, from everlasting to everlasting the Son. But when He went back into heaven, He went back as the God-man. There was a man received back into the glory. A man that was born in Bethlehem of Judea. He had forever changed. That's what giving yourself means. The sacrifice of the Son of God at the cross was when God gave His only begotten Son never to receive Him the same again. I've often wondered why people say, well, preacher, the Lord Jesus went back to heaven. God didn't really give up anything. Yes, He did. He gave up a Son that would never come back the same way again. A God-man now has seated at the right hand of the Father. That perfect union, that perfect relationship of God with His Son was now different and would never change again. There was something God gave up eternally. And I'll tell you right now, if that's not love, I don't know what love is. It's the grace of God, God giving what man does not deserve. We didn't deserve it, amen. We couldn't earn it. We couldn't do anything for it. But it was God giving to us before we ever asked for it, before we ever called upon His name. The Holy Father, and there's only one, the Holy Father gave His Son so that we could be saved. That's the grace of God. That's God looking from light through darkness. That's God God reaching my friend from glory down into hell. That's God speaking with grace and mercy to a bunch of rebellious hell-bound sinners. Yet He sent His Son, that one in glory, perfect and beautiful in every way possible, came down from above, down here where we are. That's the grace of God. Don't you notice what it says in the Bible in 2 Corinthians 8, 9 though. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. My friend, that's the grace of Jesus Christ. And think of what that grace means. Through His riches, you become rich, and He became poor. For He bequeathed to you all that He is and all that God has for Him. He has inherited all of creation and all of creation's glory. And that is passed on to you as sons of God. But the Bible said, have you heard of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? The grace of Jesus Christ means that the Bible says that He went to the cross for those that cursed Him and made fun of Him, mocked His name. He went to the cross for those that hate Him. Him. My friend, that's grace. It's grace to say I'll die for you whether you love me or not. Grace says I'll give my blood whether you even acknowledge I lived or not. Grace went to the cross. It's the grace of Jesus Christ that went to that cross. And it was that grace that He gave Himself for you freely. Nobody could earn the Son of God. How could you be worthy for that? Why, we're not worthy of anything but death. We have all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yet the Bible said, have you not heard of the grace of Jesus Christ? That for you, He was rich, 
Now, my friend, through his poverty, you have become rich. He emptied himself of his glory. He emptied himself of his power. He emptied himself of his riches. He emptied himself of all of that so that you could inherit all of that and one day be with him. Oh, the grace of God and then the grace of Jesus Christ. What a remarkable thing. And the Bible says he tasted death for every man. He tasted for the most filthy. He tasted the most vile. He tasted the worst of humanity. He drank the dregs of as low as we can get. You live long enough, you can appreciate that. For when you see man's inhumanity to man, you think to yourself, how could God die for somebody like that? How could, how could Christ love some, some, some scumbag like that? Yet he died for all. He tasted death for every man. You go back and read a little history and find out the sufferings of men at the hands of men. And you say to yourself, how could he die? He did. Have you not heard of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? I'm talking about one who freely gave himself for you. He died for the Muslim. He died for the Christian. He died for the Buddhist. He died for the Mohammedan. He died for the Confucian. He died for all mankind. He tasted death for every man. The grace of Jesus Christ took him to the cross. The grace of Jesus Christ nailed him to the cross. The grace of Jesus Christ kept him on the cross. And the grace of Jesus Christ said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's remarkable. His tormentors hung about him and mocked him and made fun of him. They cast in his teeth, spit on him. And Lord only knows all that was done to him. And yet in the face of all of it, the Bible said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He laid his life down freely for us. The grace of Jesus Christ is God's Son giving to you what you could never buy. God's Son doing for you what you're not good enough for. God's Son going all the way. The grace of Christ. My, what a thing. Now the Apostle Paul tells us again in the book of Colossians chapter number 4 and verse 6. He said, let your speech be always with grace. Seasoned with salt. That you may know how you ought to answer every man. The apostle, same apostle, apostle Paul said in Ephesians 4.29. Let no commu- corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. What I've received, I give. Who I know, I convey to you. What I have experienced, I preach to you. I do not preach theory from this pulpit. I have not preached what mama told me to preach or daddy sent me to do. I am not here today because of something that somebody else did or something else happened. And then I want to get up and tell you about it. It's okay to tell about somebody's testimony. It's wonderful to let other people know what God's done for you. But friend, when I minister grace to you, From these lips of mine, I am ministering what I have received of the Lord. I want you to know there is no line out there that you could ever cross that is so far that the grace of God can't reach across and take hold of your soul and save you by the grace of God. As long as you have breath in your body, the grace of God, His Bible says, tasted death. For every man. I am so glad that as long as God can speak to your soul and you can hear His voice, you can be saved. I am so glad that I don't care what you've done. I don't care how low you've sunk. I don't care how bad you are. The grace of God can reach you where you are. I came from the other side of the tracks. I came from the bad part of town. I came from the side over there that you don't want to hear about. And you don't want to talk about. But the grace of God reached into where I was. And He called me by His grace. The Apostle Paul said, my, 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 my. Do you know what he meant when he said that? Paul said, I was doing the best I could in my religion. I was working night and day for my righteousness. I was even even carrying people bound to have them stoned to death. And in the face of all of that, in the face of my stupidity, in the face of my religion, 
The Lord Jesus Christ came to me. Amen. Amen. If true grace has ever touched your soul, you'll minister grace to another human being. If you've ever really been forgiven, then you'll know what it is to forgive someone else. If you've ever had the balm of Gilead poured into your wounds, you'll be the first one there to help some soul that's stomped down in this old ungodly world. Grace is why this preacher ministers. I minister to grace of God to you that I have received. I'm not ministering religion to you. I'm not ministering a standard to you. I'm not ministering an achievement to you. I am ministering to you what I have received. I didn't deserve what God did for me. I couldn't buy what God did for me. I wasn't worthy of what He did for me. But His Word came to me. And His Word came to me where I was. That's grace. And the Apostle in Ephesians 2 sums it up this way. He says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And it is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Most people are eaten up with pride. Yet they don't show it. But pride motivates all their life. Everything they say or do. That is, this is why it is so hard for people like that to get right with God. For they cannot fathom in their soul how God can just forgive them for what they've done without paying Him, earning Him. Lord, I know You want to forgive me, but let me do this for You. Let, let me do something for You. Lord, I just can't receive this and You do it all. What can I do? You can't do anything. Because the moment you do something, it is no longer grace. There's a whole generation today completely perverted the doctrine of grace. They built around this great religious superstructure to make you think, well, I know you're saved, but you're going to have to keep some commandments or you're going to have to do this or you're going to have to do that. And what you've done is added to the doctrine of grace. Once the soul is born again, once the soul is completely changed, it'll keep commandments. You'll keep the commandments like you could never keep them before you were born again. You'll love them. You'll honor them. But you'll also let them point out the weakness in you. And understand that when God gave the commandment, He didn't give it to save you. He gave it to condemn you. Show you His holiness. And somebody said, when I preach him, it's so hard for me to understand. Why would not God recognize my life of faithful service? And I tithe and I'm good to people and I go to church. I've belonged to my church for 50 years. I've taught Sunday school. I've pastored. Why would God not take that into account when I stand at the judgment? He will for reward, but not for salvation. Oh yes, He'll not miss one labor of love you ever do. If you give a drink of water in His name, you'll receive your reward. You won't miss it. But that's a reward. Salvation is not a reward. Salvation can never be earned. You can never be good enough for it. I don't care if you do the best you can for 75 years. You still cannot earn salvation. Salvation must be the gift of God. It must be freely given or can't be grace. In order for grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. They're compatible. Grace and gift are compatible. But you take the element of grace out and it's no longer a gift. If you earn it, it's not a gift. If I stand up before you today and say to you, as long as from now till the day you die, you do not commit any uh, mortal sins, but just little venial sins, and we'll take care of them at confession. And as long as the indulgences and the church graces have been handed to you and given to you, you'll make it okay at the end of your life. There are people that go to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. That's the message. You know what I just told you? I just told you that you worked your way into heaven. You can't work your way into heaven. 
I know it feels good. I know it's good for the ego. I know it's something to boast in front of other men for. I realize how it appeals to your pride. I know how religion pumps you up. But you cannot be saved apart from a gift. Amen. I've known people that won't receive a gift. That's right. yeah. There have been a few times in my life, very few, but a few, I've tried to give someone something. Yeah. I said, I can't receive that. I can't accept that. Right. That's either too great a gift or for whatever reason might be, they say, no, I, can't, I can't receive that. I can't accept that. I say, why not? I want to give it to you. No strings attached. I freely give. Why do you want to give it to me? Because I want you to have it. That's all. You mean that's your only motive? That's my only motive. I just want to give you something. I have on occasion given people things and handed it to them and they say, what's this for? How many times have you given someone something and they say, What's this for? Right. Have you ever had that response? Yeah. You understand they're not receiving a gift. Mm-hmm. If it's for something, it's not a gift. Well, it's for being faithful to church. That's not a gift. No. Right. Right. Amen. 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 Well, I haven't done anything to anybody. Still not a gift. A gift is something given to you. No strings attached. Amen. That's good, preacher. Amen. No strings attached. You don't deserve it. You're not worthy of it. But that's not the issue. The issue is He has a gift He wants to give you. Amen. The grace of God that bringeth salvation appear to all men. God's grace in His Son. God's grace preaches His Word. God's grace convicts your heart. God's grace saves you. If you're willing to accept a gift. You mean preacher that's all there is to it? No strings attached? Oh no, no, no. God's not going to... You don't have to stop doing anything. Oh, now hold on, preacher. I just can't believe that now. I'm telling you right now. Oh, no, no. no, no, no. I'm turning you off. God is not going to save anybody until they're willing to quit what they're doing. Oh, is that right? Do you believe that, Brother Peach? No, not at all. You see, that's a string attached. That, that's a condition. Any condition you put on a gift, no longer a gift like the government when they give you some money they got a whole lot of strings attached make no mistake about that you got a school or an institution of some kind you get federal money <laughs> mark it down you get federal papers with it you didn't get a gift you got an obligation God's salvation is not saying to you you're going to have to quit this and you got to quit that and you got to quit this and you got to quit that God's salvation is saying to you, by the grace of God, you don't deserve anything. You ought to go to hell. But I'm willing to give you something today that you could never buy, that is freely given, no strings attached. And the reason I'm giving it to you is because I'm, the grace of God is giving you a free gift. Can you receive it? Can you receive that? Well, my preacher, I'm going to tell you the truth. My pride just won't let me do it. Well, I'm glad you're honest. I really am. Because you'd feel a whole lot better if you did something for God to show Him how much you appreciated it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. God's got plenty of gifts just as long as you let Him know how much you appreciate them. Amen. So you'll go out and do anything to receive His gift. It's not a gift anymore. Right. Right. It's when He does for you what He did for those ten lepers. Yes, sir. Amen. He gave them the gift of healing. Right. Not a one of them deserved it. But one Samaritan turned around and walked back to him. And he received far more than the other nine. When he walked back to him, the Bible says, the Lord spoke and said, Where are the nine? None save this one Samaritan to return. Give glory to God. Go thy way. Thou art what? Whole. Whole. You see, he came back and received far more a simple gift. He knew he didn't deserve it, but he received it. Now, here's how you receive forgiveness. Let's say, Christian, you've made a bummer of it. Yes. Let's say you've blown it. Let's say you got yourself in a mess. All right, Christian? I mean, you're really a Christian. You're really saved. You're really born again. 
and you ran your mouth for 20 years about people doing something, you wound up doing it yourself. Did the very thing you run people down for, and now you feel like the worst hypocrite that ever lived. Can't live with yourself. Don't look at yourself in the mirror. Now you're living in a living hell. Let me tell you something. Forgiveness is received exactly the way salvation is received. It's the gift of God. The Bible said if you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. When I preach, i got to show him I mean it. What do you mean show him? How are you going to show him you mean it? Do you want to be forgiven? <coughs> do you want to be forgiven? Yes, I do, preacher. Well, then receive it from him. Like you received your salvation. Then let the Holy Spirit begin his work. Because at the moment that you receive forgiveness, the Holy Ghost now comes into the home and he begins to rebuild. The Holy Spirit's work is to rebuild and restore, bring back into fellowship and communion with the Father. The Holy Ghost's work in your life could do far more than you'll ever do. Once that heart is right with God, the Holy Spirit comes in and communion, fellowship and power and joy comes back where it was long gone. But you can't bring it back. You can't make it happen. You can't force communion. But when the heart is right with God, it's fertile ground yes, sir. for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Hidden sins will keep that from happening. Yes, sir. Hidden sins. Yes, sir. Do we have any Achans in here? Who's Achan, preacher? Yes, sir. Achan was an Israelite. Yes, right. When Joshua took Jericho, the Bible says that God said, Jericho is cursed, yes. holy to me. Don't you touch a thing that belongs to Jericho. It's all mine. So they went into Jericho. It fell. But what happened? He took a goodly Babylonian garment, wedge of gold, buried it in the middle of his tent, hid it. He hid it just like we hide stuff. Sneaking around. Isn't that stupid? You believe in God, yet you're sneaking around. Isn't that dumb? Turn the lights out and sneak around. Well, if your God's no bigger than that, you don't have a God. If He can't see in the dark, my friend, you're in bad shape. Amen? Amen. You still think you're dealing with mom and dad, don't you? All things are naked and open to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. And now you've dug a hole and buried it and covered it up and patted it down, moved the furniture back over it and set it down like nothing had happened. <laughs> but it's in here. And it's eating at you. It's eating at your soul. It's eating at you. If you're born again, it'll eat you till you die if you don't confess it. So how do I do it, preacher? You can't do anything about it. You can't make it better. You can't even pull it out of you. You can't change anything. Well, what can I do, preacher? Confess it. I believe the Greek word there is homologia. Lagia means word. Lagos is word. Hama means of the same. You know, homosexual, same sex, clinical term created has no meaning. Homologia means I agree with God's word. No longer do I, do I put up an excuse, barrier, hide, run, blame game with somebody else. Lord, I accept what you say that I am. <laughs> I accept it. All right. <laughs> no more excuses. All right. I did it. And you understand all the circumstances. God, I want some peace in here. Help me. Forget me. Right then, at that moment, the Holy Spirit will do something inside you that is just as miraculous as your salvation was when you got saved. And you'll feel that thing go. You'll feel it leave you. That burden will be gone. And the song will come back in your heart. The light in your step. And the fellowship with God. And once again you'll be shouting the victory and saying, It's good to be saved. Hallelujah. And when you testify, your testimony will have power. That's what some of you Christians need to do. You ever done that, preacher? You better believe I've done it. done it more than once. I've crawled in my hole and shut that door 
when there was a controversy between me and God and I didn't come out of that hole till I got settled. Amen. Amen. Controversy. God will have one with you occasionally. Sometimes He'll call you to do something you won't do it. Nobody could know it. Yeah, right. Nobody knows what goes on in the human heart between you and God. Why, you could live out the rest of your days as the most pious, holy man of God or woman of God on the face of the earth. And nobody would know a thing but you and God. So I get in that hole and shut the door and say, I didn't do what you told me to. I know you didn't do what I told you to. I know that. You don't have to tell me. But I just wanted you to confess it. Admit it. You didn't do what I told you. That's right, Lord. I didn't do it. And then if you want to go ahead and give him all your reasons why you didn't do it, go ahead and spell it out there. Pour it out. If it'll make you feel better. But it won't change a thing. You know what'll matter? Is when you confess it. I didn't do what you told me to do. God said, hand that girl a track. I'm not going to do it. I'm embarrassed. I'm backward. God said, go there and pray with so and so. No, I'm not going to do it. Old so-and-so doesn't like me. God said, do something. You don't do it. After a while, you get to where you don't hear His voice anymore. Why isn't He talking to you? God talks to us. You think, you're crazy, preacher? No, I'm not crazy. He talks to us. There's a woman sitting right over there. Right there. Brenda Bickle. Fell and hit her head. Same thing could have happened to her that happened to that sweet Margie Moody, one of the finest women I ever knew in my life. She died a few days later. Yeah. Margie Moody did. God took her home. Her daughter called me at the house. Said, would you pray for my mother? A voice spoke to me immediately and said, go right now up to your closet, shut the door, get on your face, and start praying for that woman. Amen. That's what I did. But I could have got up in the car and gone down to Walgreens or over to Walmart or just get out and wander around the woods somewhere and not pray. Who would have known it? Because I could have told her I prayed. Who would have known it? Nobody would have known it but me and God. So I went in there, closed the door, got on my face and prayed for her. Amen. Obedience. Yes, sir. Is better than sacrifice. Amen, Amen. Yes, sir. And to obey than the fat of rams. Right. Amen. I hope I got that over to you this morning. Amen. You can't earn it. You can't be good enough for it. And it's freely given. The grace of God yes. will offer to you forgiveness at this very moment. Amen. If you'll confess it, He'll forgive you right here. Right. You don't have to confess it to me. Right. Amen. No human being can carry all that. Right. Right. If right. the world confessed their sins to me, I'd go insane. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. You don't have to confess it to me. Confess it to God. And He'll forgive you for it. If you're unsaved, there's a gift waiting for you. A wondrous gift. No strings attached. Once you receive the gift, the work will start from the inside. And it'll bust some strings loose from you. Father, in Jesus' name, I hope I preached what you put on my heart and that you used this preacher and spoke through my heart. I pray, Heavenly Father, I conveyed the message of grace across to the people this morning. There's somebody sitting in this house right now, Lord. They're hurting. God, they're hurting. They're hurting. They've taken into their bosom, Lord, a fire, and it's burning them. There's a cancer eating at their soul. And our Heavenly Father, they don't have any peace. They haven't had peace in a long time. And Lord, they've gotten to the point probably where they don't think they'll ever have any peace. So there's no hope for them. But our Heavenly Father, I know how freely you save and how freely you forgive. And I know the power of the blood. And I know that blood covenant that we're bound with with thee. And I know what you've done for us. I pray for that soul. There may be somebody sitting in this house this morning, Lord, who's never received that free gift. They've tried to earn it. They've worked for it. They've tried to be good enough. They've done everything they can think of. And they're still frustrated because they know they don't have salvation. When all they have to do is receive a gift. A free gift. No strings attached. In Jesus' name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. Anybody like to come down here to the front? Pray, anybody? Christian, you have an advocate with the Father. 
You do. And you have an intercessor with the Father. And you have a mediator with the Father. My goodness. You don't even need a human being around you to get right with God. Do you know that, Christian? You don't need to confess to some man. Just you and the Lord. You and God. Is it eating at your soul? Don't let it eat any longer. Is something eating you up today? Don't let it. Don't let it. Don't let it, Christian. When God saved you, He gave you a promise that you're more than a conqueror through Him that loved you. You don't have to live beaten to death and defeated under the power of sin. Would you like to come? Would you like to come down? Talk to your father. Christian, if you're born again, I'm talking to my brothers and my sisters, and you know you can talk to your father. You know you can. I can't get between you and your father. Nobody can get between me and my father. Nobody. I have a direct access to the father. Come on, Christian. Born again, believer. I feel with all my soul that's where this is, message is directed this morning. Believers, but there may be somebody in this house that's never received the free gift of God. Never received it. Oh, if I could only get you to understand, it's a free gift. <laughs> and I'm not giving it. I can preach about that gift and tell you who gives it, but the gift is not in my hand to give. The gift is in the Father's hand. He gives eternal life. Not me. I'm just a mouth. I'm just a messenger. That's all I am, folks. That's all I am. God that I preach is the one that does the saving. He gives the gift. He does the healing. He does the deliverance. It's the Lord, not me. Man, I want that clear. I want... <laughs> it's not me, folks. It's not about who I am or what I've accomplished. It's about Him. It's all about Him. You know, people can do things in this world that are simply heinous. They are. Defy understanding. So bad... You say to yourself, how in the world, man? I mean, good. You look at that and you think, my, my. Yet God will forgive them. He'll forgive them. He'll forgive them. He'll forgive them. He'll forgive them. Can you receive it? If you can receive forgiveness, forgiveness is yours. Well, I just wish I could do something, preacher. You'll be doing plenty once you've received forgiveness. The Holy Ghost will begin to work in you. But the doing has nothing to do with the receiving. Receiving is a simple act where you receive what the Father has done. He's already done it too. Did you know that? Work's already finished. Everything's been done, accomplished. God doesn't have to do another thing to forgive you. He doesn't have to. He cannot. He will not add to what's been done. He offered Himself one time without spot to God. The Lord Jesus Christ did everything that was necessary, not only for the salvation of the sinner, but for the sanctification of the sinner. And for the final glorification of the sinner, it was all done by the work of Christ at the cross. Nothing can be added to that. Nothing. You cannot add to the work of Christ. His work is finished, complete, and perfect. Now he's become the author of eternal salvation to all them that believe on him. Is there anybody sitting in this house this morning unsaved? You don't have to walk out of here unsaved. Let me warn you now. Let me warn you. I believe we're coming down to the end of this age. I believe the church age is about finished. I believe you're living in a transitional time now. If you are unsaved, you're going to be facing the mark of the beast, the Antichrist. The Antichrist will rise soon. We may have already seen him. Amen. There are some things happening right now that cause me to shudder. When I taught in Sunday school this morning, I taught our Sunday school class about things happening right now that if they don't cause you to alarm, I don't know what will. We're living in the end time. The Lord's coming back. If you're unsaved, you're going to be faced with a mark. You take that mark and you'll eternally be condemned with no hope forever. Don't take the mark. Don't take it. Don't take it. Don't take it. Receive the Lord Jesus. Accept Him. Accept Him. Receive Him.